This lecture will cover online assignment number 12, which deals with the problem scenarios and factual causation. So we already have covered the two main tests for factual cause, the but-for test and the substantial factor test. And to some extent, we've already taken a look at one of the problems that's specific to the but-for test. In the independent sufficient cause scenario, we saw that a defendant who is negligent may escape responsibility under the but-for test. And so the solution that the courts have come up with is to replace the but-for test with the substantial factor test in these circumstances. Now there's a number of other scenarios that we're going to explore in this lecture that are a problem actually for both the but-for test and the substantial factor test. One of these is known as alternative liability. A second, which is similar, is known as market share liability. And a third is called the lost chance or lost chance of survival doctrine. So in each of these problem scenarios, the courts have created alternative tests that will replace the but-for or substantial factor tests in order to serve some kind of public policy. So we're going to be basically approaching each one of these exceptional scenarios in the same way. We'll identify the problem and try to point out or highlight the facts or factors that create that problem so that you can identify it in, in other fact patterns. We'll also look at the elements of proof that are necessary to establish the alternative theory. We'll look at the policy justifications for creating a different test beyond but-for causation or substantial factor causation. And then we'll use our cases to show how these particular doctrines will be applied. Now, take note that the alternative liability theory technically could be used in any kind of scenario. And by that, I mean it's not pigeonholed to a particular type of tort case. Now, that's not necessarily true of the other two exceptional doctrines. Market share liability was created in a products liability context and is most likely to arise there. And even though we're not going to be exploring products liability in depth, the uniqueness of the market share causation analysis is so significant that we're going to take a look at it no matter what. Finally, the loss of chance doctrine is one that arises pretty much in medical malpractice cases. Now, some folks have thought about extending the rationale to other situations, but for the most part, when you think of lost chance, it's going to be in a medical malpractice case. Let's first turn to the doctrine of alternative liability. And as I mentioned, we'll first set up the problem by looking at the facts. Now here we had three hunters who went out on a hunting trip to um, shoot quail, and they were supposed to remain in line as they were proceeding through their hunting expedition. But at some point, the plaintiff gets ahead of our two defendants, and so they're forming a kind of triangular pattern. Well, a quail rises up, and our two defendants fire at the quail, and they wind up, at least one of them winds up striking the plaintiff, who happened to be um, in the direction of their shot. Now, what's critically important here is, it's not like their shots combined to produce a single force that ultimately caused the plaintiff's injury. It's not like the independent sufficient cause scenario. Here, only one of these defendant shooters actually shot the plaintiff. The other defendant actually did not. And so in this scenario, we have a problem both for the but-for test and for the substantial factor test because we don't know who or which of these defendants actually um, fired the offending shot. You can't say whether or not defendant number one was a but-for cause or if defendant number two was a but-for cause. You also can't say whether or not either defendant was a substantial factor. As it turns out, one of these defendants was the only factor and the other was no factor whatsoever. We just can't determine who's who. So what's the solution to this dilemma? 
In this Summers versus Tice case, which is the first case to ever address the concept of alternative liability, the court decides to take the extraordinary action of shifting the burden of proof on the issue of causation from the plaintiff to the defendant to force the defendant to offer evidence to exculpate himself, that is to show that he was not the defendant who caused the plaintiff's injury. If the defendant is unable to explain to the jury or to the court um, why he was not the cause, then that defendant would be held liable as a joint tortfeasor. Now we haven't talked a lot about joint tort joint tortfeasor status, but it really just means that each defendant in theory could be held liable for all of the plaintiff's loss. So if the plaintiff had $100,000 of damage, the plaintiff could execute that full judgment against either one of these defendants or could split it up between them however he or she wanted. That is, the plaintiff could take 70% from one and 30 from the other or 50 and 50 or 100% against one and none against the other. So that's the solution that the court comes up with. But let's lay out now the elements or the conditions that the court at least insinuated were necessary for this doctrine to apply. First, the court was adamant that both of these defendants, these hunters were negligent, that they should not have fired their weapons in the direction of the plaintiff. And so both of them violated the standard of reasonable care. And that means that both of them deserve punishment and frankly could use some deterrence as well. All of these, or in this case, both of these defendants are in court. And so we know that if the defendants are not capable of exculpating themselves, we are going to get the actual shooter because they're both in court. The actually causally responsible person is going to be held liable. There's also a small number of defendants here. There's only two. And so there's a 50-50 chance that either one of them was the cause of the plaintiff's injury. Remember, the plaintiff's typical burden of proof is to establish to a 51% probability that the defendant caused the injury. And so the court's really only fudging that extra 1% from 50 to 51% to shift the burden of proof to these defendants. So the fact that there was only two defendants and that the fudge factor on the burden of persuasion was so small was a critical factor in producing this result. Finally, we have another scenario like in Race Ipsa Locator where the plaintiff really couldn't establish what had happened. The plaintiff didn't really have access to the evidence as to who was firing or what each um, hunter was thinking or what they were doing. The hunters themselves had superior access to the evidence. And so it made some sense to shift the burden from the plaintiff to the parties, the defendants, who had the better ability to establish what had happened. And so these are now all required elements for an alternative liability theory. The plaintiff must establish that all defendants were negligent. They're all in court, so we're certain to get the, the true wrongdoer. There's a small number, so we're not fudging too much on the burden of persuasion. And it has to be clear that the plaintiff really doesn't have any other ability to overcome the causation problem. And it makes good sense to shift the burden to the defendant. All right, now let's look at how the alternative liability doctrine can be applied. We'll use the Burke versus Schaffner case to get a, a good handle on this and we'll work through the elements of alternative liability to see how the court wound up addressing them. So we've got a plaintiff here who, who was injured when he got struck by a pickup truck. Now we know Malone was the person sitting behind the wheel of that truck and Ms. Schaffner was his passenger and apparently there were some other people who were trying to get into the truck and there's some dispute as to exactly what happened. Malone swears that he did not put his foot on the accelerator. He contends that Schaffner, as she was moving about, put her foot on the accelerator and that's what caused the truck to move forward. Schaffner, of course, says, no, I did not touch the accelerator. And that suggests that Malone must have been the person to do so and that he's the one that really caused the plaintiff's injuries. So notice we have a classic alternative liability problem. That is, we've got multiple parties 
and only one of them actually caused the injury. That is, there's, there's no question that these parties both put their feet on the accelerator at the same time. It's either going to be Malone or Schaffner. We just don't know who it was that put their, their foot on the accelerator. So we've got a classic alternative liability problem. The question is whether or not the elements are satisfied in order for the doctrine to solve this conundrum. So as I said, let's go through the elements to see if it's going to work. And sure enough, it starts off on a pretty favorable note that just as in the Summers versus Tice case, in this case, there are only two possible parties who might have caused the injury. One was Malone and the other was Schaffner. And because you have a small number of defendants, um, there's a 50-50 chance that it was either one. So that's a good start. The second consideration is the defendant's superior access to proof, and that does seem to be satisfied here. The plaintiff was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and Shafter and Malone were the two parties who were in the truck, and so they would seem to know what actually occurred and whose foot likely was put on the accelerator. So it does make some sense for them to come forward and explain what they were doing. But that's about as far as the plaintiff is going to get through the elements of uh, alternative liability. Now, in the question of are all these defendants in court, originally the plaintiff had come to Malone, but Malone had settled with the plaintiff, and so Malone was not a defendant in this case. Only Schaffner was a defendant at the time of trial, and so it's quite possible that if the court were to apply alternative liability and shift the burden of proof to Schaffner, and supposing Schaffner is not capable of exculpating herself, it could be that Schaffner really was not the person who put her foot on that accelerator. And so she as an innocent party would then be entirely responsible for the plaintiff's loss. Because we don't have all of the possible defendants in court, we do have this at least possibility that the wrongdoer, who could be Malone, would escape a verdict, and the courts don't like that possible outcome. The other problem here is that we really can't say that both Malone and Schaffner were negligent. Certainly whoever put their foot on that accelerator seems to have violated a standard of reasonable care, but that does not in any way suggest that the other party was negligent. So first, let's suppose that Malone was the person that, that put, maybe accidentally put his foot on the accelerator. For all we know, Schaffner, who was just sliding around to accommodate the other people coming to the truck, was just doing what a passenger ordinarily does. And if she didn't touch the accelerator, in no way influenced Malone's behavior. Or if Malone was just sitting there innocently behind the wheel, and Shafter slid over and she stuck her foot on the accelerator. Malone seems to be innocent and Shafter seems to be the only party who did anything wrong. So in this case, it seems a little bit wrong to shift the burden of proof and potentially hold both parties responsible when one of those parties not only was not a factual cause, but also was not even negligent. Now the policies of punishment and deterrence don't apply at all to that other party. And so it would seem to be completely unfair to make the innocent party jointly responsible along with perhaps the other party who really was at fault. So because of those reasons, the court refuses to apply the alternative liability doctrine. And without that assist, it looks like the plaintiff is gonna have a great deal of difficulty overcoming the factual cause problem in this case. All right, let's turn to another multiple actor causation problem that's similar to alternative liability, but still is distinctively different. This one's called market share liability. It typically arises in products liability cases, and it really originates from a California Supreme Court decision in Sindel versus Abbott Labs. In Sindel, we have a bunch of pharmaceutical manufacturers that were producing a drug called DES um, back in the 1940s through the 1970s. And this drug was prescribed to pregnant women as a miscarriage preventative. Now, unfortunately, the mothers who took this drug would then have daughters 
and their daughters would develop various forms of cancer. And that was true of the plaintiff in this case. The plaintiff was a DES daughter who had developed bladder cancer and she contends that, that was because of the constituent chemicals within DES. Now, since the time that her mother took those pills, a lot of those manufacturers had actually gone out of business. And so even though there had been originally 200 manufacturers of DES, there were dramatically fewer numbers of those pharmaceutical makers still around. And so the plaintiff winds up suing 11 of those. But the reality is that the plaintiff really couldn't be sure which manufacturer actually made the pills that her mother had taken and therefore had caused her, her cancer. So we do have this similar pattern where there are multiple possible parties who may have caused the injury, but only one of them actually did. That, that is the plaintiff's mother had only purchased from one manufacturer. We just don't know which manufacturer of the possible 200 who placed the drug on the market who really did cause the plaintiff's injury. So we've got the same kind of problem that we had in the other scenarios. The plaintiff can't prove to a 51% probability that any of the 11 defendants in court was a but-for cause because it's quite possible that one of the other 200 manufacturers may have been the actual manufacturer that sold the pills to the plaintiff's mother. We also can't say that any one of those 11 manufacturers was a substantial factor because there was really only one manufacturer whose drugs was the only factor and all of the other manufacturers were not a factor at all. And so neither the but-for test nor the substantial factor test seems to work. But also notice that the alternative liability theory doesn't seem to work here. We don't have two possible defendants as we did in the alternative liability scenario. Here we have 200 manufacturers who may have been responsible and 11 who are in court. Now, mentioning these manufacturers in court, we don't have all of the 200. We only have 11. And so it's very possible that one of the manufacturers or the manufacturer that had sold the pills that the plaintiff's mother had taken is not among that 11, is not in court at all. And so some of the foundational rationales behind alternative liability don't apply. The elements of that doctrine don't seem to exist here. And so the court now has a hard choice to make. It can either, either contort alternative liability and kind of screw up that doctrine and some of its policy implications, or it seems like it would then have to let the, the plaintiff's case fail because the plaintiff otherwise can't prove causation. But there's a third way, and so the court comes up with a new doctrine to solve this particular problem. Now the solution is very much similar to alternative liability. It is to shift the burden of proof on the issue of causation from the plaintiff to the defendants and force the defendants to try to exculpate themselves. That is, to force them to try to show that in fact that they were not responsible for producing the actual pill that caused the injury. Now, how would you do that? Now, presumably the manufacturers, because they have access to the sales records, would be able to find out where they were selling the pill. Some of those manufacturers may not have sold in California at all, and if they had those records, they would be able to introduce those records into evidence to indicate that they couldn't possibly have sold the pills to the plaintiff's mother because they didn't sell any pills into California. The problem was, that most of these manufacturers did not keep records beyond seven years, and so their sales or marketing records had long since been destroyed. Now that wasn't the plaintiff's fault, that really is a situation created by the manufacturers themselves, and so part of, I think, the policy implication here is the courts want to shift the burden of proof to the manufacturers in order to incentivize them to keep records that are better and keep them longer so that if they do have a burden shift, they'll actually be able to come forward and demonstrate to whom they had sold their products. Now, that's just the first part of the solution. The second part is that 
the manufacturers would not be jointly responsible for the entirety of the plaintiff's loss. Whichever manufacturers are not able to exculpate themselves would be held proportionally liable. That means that they'd be held responsible based on their market share. And so the court would have to determine and they would have to produce evidence as to how much of the market they had controlled at the time that the plaintiff's mother had taken these pills. And so if you had a 5% share of the market, you could only be held responsible in proportion to that market share. That is, you could only be held responsible for 5% of the plaintiff's loss if you were unable to exculpate yourself from the case. Now, what are the conditions that would allow for this solution to hold? One is that all of the manufacturers that are in the case and are unable to get themselves out would have to be shown to be negligent. Now in this case, DES was made exactly the same way. It was a fungible product with the same constituent chemicals no matter who made it. And so because those constituent chemicals were unreasonable and negligent, every manufacturer who had made DES was doing something unreasonable under the circumstances. And so we could fault all of those manufacturers and frankly, we feel okay shifting to them the responsibility of coming forward with evidence to act exculpate themselves and frankly if they can't get themselves off the hook we don't feel bad about punishing them for putting out what is a bad product. Now here's where the market share part comes into play here. The second requirement is the plaintiff must sue a number of defendants whose combined market share is substantial. Now, the California Supreme Court never explained what it meant by a substantial share of the market. One interpretation is that that means that the plaintiff must sue a number of defendants whose combined market share back in the time when the plaintiff's mother was taking the pill was greater than 50%. That rationale would be more likely than not if you've got a greater than 50% share represented in the case then you probably will get the manufacturer that sold the offending pill. If you were to interpret substantial as anything less than 51%, then you're not necessarily more likely than not going to get the, the wrongdoer. So let's kind of do a modification of the facts here to see how we would apply the market share theory. So let's suppose that the plaintiff actually sues five defendants and here's their percentage market share for each one. Let's suppose that defendant number one had 5% of the market. Defendant number two sold 10% of DES at the time that the plaintiff's mother took it. Defendant number three had 15% share of the market. And defendant number four had a 25% share. And so when you combine the total market share for those five defendants, you would have 55% of the total market for DES represented. That would exceed that 51%, which seems to be substantial in order to, to cross or meet that particular requirement. Now, let's suppose that the plaintiff had a million dollars of damage. How much of that damage would each defendant be responsible for? Well, because this is proportional liability, because defendant number one is only 5% responsible, that defendant would only have a 5% share of the $1 million. That means defendant number one is responsible for $50,000. So moving to defendant number two, 10% share of the market means 10% proportional liability. That defendant is now responsible for $100,000. Moving down to defendant three, 15% means a $150,000 responsibility. And defendant number four, 25% means a $250,000 responsibility. So notice here that the plaintiff's recovery would be $550,000. Now, the plaintiff is going to get a substantial chunk of 
of her actual damages, but notice that the plaintiff is not going to get full recovery. And this is the kind of compromise justice that market share liability creates. No defendant is going to have to bear the entire responsibility for the plaintiff's loss, um, and the plaintiff is not going to get full recovery. Uh, and so there is a kind of accommodation of interest between defendants and plaintiffs. It's not perfect justice, but it's good enough justice in order to get the plaintiff something um, for the loss sustained as a result of these negligent parties putting a bad drug on the market. Our last scenario presents another really interesting causation problem that is resolved by something called the loss of chance doctrine. Now this is raised in the Lord versus Lovett case. Here we have a woman who was in a car accident and as a result of that accident suffered a spinal cord injury. The doctor, however, did not diagnose that correctly, and as a result, he didn't treat that spinal cord injury the way that he should have, and the plaintiff's contention is that the doctor, therefore, has caused her to suffer more paralysis or more of the side effects um, of that paralysis injury than she otherwise would have experienced if he had done the right thing and had diagnosed her correctly from the very beginning. But I want you to assume that when the plaintiff was presented to the doctor that she already had less than a 51 percent chance of a better outcome. That is, when she came to the doctor, more likely than not, she was going to be paralyzed and she was going to have all of the things that she's now complaining about. If you were to do the but-for analysis, it doesn't look like the doctor is responsible for that paralysis because it looks like that was a foregone conclusion. The doctor's um, reasonable care would not have prevented this bad outcome. And so if we were just to apply the but-for test, the plaintiff would lose that case, she would get no compensation, and the doctor would not be punished for his malpractice and would not receive any kind of deterrence as a result of the injury that he might have prevented. So what's the solution to all of this? The court suggests that there's a couple of different ways that that a jurisdiction could respond. I'm only going to deal with the approach that this court actually adopts and that the editors of your casebook suggest is the majority approach. This is known as the loss of chance doctrine. And so the innovation here is to reformulate or redefine the injury sustained by the plaintiff. Instead of the plaintiff saying that she has suffered the damage of paralysis and now seeks all of the, the consequences and the costs associated with her paralysis, the court says what she really lost was an opportunity to avoid being fully paralyzed. And so I want you to analogize this to a lottery and a lottery ticket. Someone who has their lottery ticket torn up doesn't lose the full jackpot that's available for that lottery. Someone who has their ticket torn up has lost something. They've lost the value of the ticket, and that might be indicated by the price that you paid for the ticket. And so if you lost the substantial chance of winning the lottery because your ticket was uh, destroyed by somebody, then you should be entitled to whatever the value of the ticket is, not to the full jackpot that you might have won if your ticket turned out to be the winner. In this case, it looks like this woman had a chance of getting a better outcome of avoiding paralysis and the doctor had torn up her lottery ticket at that chance. So it wouldn't make sense here for the court to award her full damages, but because the doctor actually did um, reduce her opportunities for a better outcome, you can say that the doctor was a factual cause in substantially reducing her chance for a, a better outcome, and as a result, he should be responsible for something. Now, how do you put a value on a lost chance? That is, what's the value of her lottery ticket of having an outcome where she wouldn't be paralyzed? Well, 
even though this court doesn't really discuss it, most jurisdictions have come up with what is proportional liability, that you would take the total amount of damages that the plaintiff has suffered as, as a result of being fully paralyzed, and you would reduce that total amount of damages by the plaintiff's lost chance. So let's suppose that in this case that a medical expert is able to come in and say that the doctor's negligence reduced the plaintiff's chances of avoiding paralysis by 10%. And let's assume that the plaintiff has now a million dollars of paralysis damages. You would take that million dollars of actual paralysis damages, you'd multiply it by the 10% loss of a chance of a better outcome, and that would mean that the plaintiff's actual damages for the lost opportunity of a better outcome would be $100,000. And so in some ways, this is kind of similar to market share liability, where the plaintiff doesn't get full recovery, but gets at least something. And here that something would be at least $100,000. It would be the full paralysis damages discounted by the 10% chance that the doctor denied her at a better outcome. So once again, this is not perfect justice, but it is a doctrine that gives the plaintiff some opportunity to get some compensation, and it does give some kind of punishment and deterrence to an unreasonable or negligent doctor.